Muito obrigado. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you all for being here. Unfortunately, I'm not Brazilian. Um, I have to say, perhaps I wish I was because I love your country and uh, I've been there many times. I'm from Spain um, and I came here to MIT three years ago. And as Christina was saying, for the last two years, I've been doing research with Professor Andrew Law, who is the head of the finance department uh, here in MIT. And I come to you today with uh, good news. Uh, the good news is that um, there's hope for finance. Um, the good news is that uh, there are more things that uh, I believe the world of finance can do for the world of science. And uh, the purpose of our work is that uh, in the future, science will no longer progress at the speed of finance, at the speed at which we can provide resources for science, but rather at the speed of science, uh, at the speed at which scientists can solve problems. The work that we've been doing for the last two years is around how we can use financial engineering to provide more resources for science. And we've uh, focused on the case for drug development and more specifically for the market for oncology drugs. How to finance new drugs in preclinical and clinical phases that are being developed to cure cancer. The results and the information I'm gonna share with you today has been already published in Nature Biotechnology in, in, this, in this month's edition. And I'll be happy to distribute copies of the papers and be in touch with you if you guys have any questions. Let me start by talking a little bit about something you may be familiar with, which is how biotechnology is financed. More specifically in the States and also around the world, the structure for financing new drugs is very similar. We know that everything starts in universities or hospitals where basic research is done, and then it translates in a phase in which we start to think through, you know, what are the molecules, what are the characteristics that a molecule would need in order to become a new drug. In the States, the US government invests every year roughly 30 billion in this phase of development. Then we go into a more challenging phase in the sense that there are less resources for it. An estimate of how much every year we spend in the States is approximately $10 billion for this phase that some people call the valley of theft, and is the valley that resides between you know, the basic research and the preclinical and clinical phases of drug development. If we move later in the development of new drugs, then pharmaceutical companies generally come in. Obviously, they like to take compounds that have already been de-risked, that are already advanced, and for which the probabilities of successfully becoming drugs are significantly better. And they invest a lot of money. They invest up to approximately 130 billion per year. Later in the development, there are some other forms of getting financing for new drugs, such as, for example, doing IPOs in the public markets, but nowadays we know that market is very small. Or, for example, there are some companies who acquire intellectual property and they try to monetize the value of the future royalties, but those aren't very big either. Once the drug gets approved, there is a possibility of using debt to finance the cash flows generated by the successful drugs that have been approved. And this is a, also a pretty large market, but you need to get the drug approved before, obviously, you can have access to it. So basically, as you can see, there is you know, this value of debt that you may be very familiar with. And the question that we raise is, is there any way to think through how to bring more funding in this particular area? And are there more efficient ways to use the power of capital markets to bring funding for research? In addition to this, there are two problems that you can also see in this slide. One of them is the fact that in spite of the growth in funding coming from pharmaceutical companies, the number of new drugs approved here in the States have remained quite stable. That is to say, the productivity of research and development has been going down over the past few years. At the same time, and going back to the value of death, one problem that we're seeing is that over the last five years, the number of new venture capital firms that invest in biotechnology has been going down by over 30%. So we have a picture that doesn't really look so well in terms of the ability of resources for new drugs to be developed. The fact that it's so hard to develop a drug can be explained by the nature of the drug development process. Obviously, the probability of getting a new drug developed is very low. Here, for example, we make an example. Um, you may have a drug that has a probability of 5% of successfully being developed, and therefore 95% of failing. 
any investor who is facing this choice would probably be very reluctant to put their money on the development of this new drug because obviously there's a high probability that he will lose his money. However, this entire proposition changes significantly if instead of thinking of a single drug, we think of a portfolio of drugs. If we think of a portfolio of drugs, what happens is that the probability of getting at least one drug approved grows significantly. And in this particular case, for example, if the probability of failure is 5% and we put together a portfolio of 150 drugs, the probability of at least one drug being approved would be 95%. The probability of getting five dr at least five drugs approved would be 87% and so forth. Therefore, we could say that it is very likely that if instead of offering investors the probability of investing in a single drug, this is what in finance we call idiosyncratic risk, we offer them the possibility of investing in a portfolio of drugs, the risk return profile of this portfolio is such that there is a much higher likelihood that we convince investors to put their money into this proposition. The question is, is this possible in finance? And the answer is, yes it is, and we've seen it in other markets. And this is what was very encouraging for us. You may all have heard about the securitization market. And probably what you have heard about it is no good news. Many people say financial innovation was one of the reasons why we're now in the current economic situation. And the financial innovation that led the boom in financial markets up to 2007 is basically securitization. Now let's try to understand what securitization is. First of all, if you take a look at this picture, you will see that securitization is nothing new. It's not something that was developed in the 2000s and that led to the crisis. It's something that over 25 years had been very successful in channeling funds to certain markets. For example, since 1970, the securitization markets were launched with the creation of the first mortgage-backed securities. We'll talk a little bit more about what this is. Since 1985, the securitization market was used to finance other types of assets. And I'll also talk a little bit more about this. Well, what's important we understand is that there were very few occasions in which securitization was used to finance biotechnology or finance drugs. There are basically just a bunch of small exceptions in which this financing tool was used to, for example, finance the royalties of new drugs that had been approved, or for example, small loans that were given to companies for them to be able to acquire you know, equipment that they needed for doing the research. So we thought, huh, if this hasn't been done, why is the reason why it hasn't been done? And is there something that we could do about it? And what we found out is that basically, you know, this is a more challenging market. The nature of the assets is, is more difficult to understand. There are no good tools to do the analysis of what is the risk and what is the return. And the bottom line is there are not that many people that understand the basics of science or actually you know, understand very well the drug development process. So we thought perhaps one thing we need to do is to develop a framework so that investors and Wall Street bankers can more easily understand this. And this is the bulk of the work we've done. But let me tell you a little bit more about what securitization is. And I think you're all going to understand it. Basically, securitization means that you're going to create a capital structure that, for example, in this case, would have different types of, of securities, senior debt, junior debt, and equity. And you would sell these securities to investors. When you sell the securities, you would raise some funds. You would use these funds to acquire collateral. And by collateral, we mean assets that are generating cash flows over time. And as time passes, this collateral would be generating cash flows. And we would use these cash flows to pay back the debt. We start with the senior debt, then the junior debt. And if any cash flows remain, we use that to pay back the, the equity holders. Now, in the case of the securitization of a portfolio of drugs, the important thing is that the collateral that would need to generate those cash flows would need to be a portfolio of drugs being developed. Let me tell you a little bit more about this. Once again, if we look at the case of a single drug, a single drug would, for example, you know, be in phase one or eventually be discontinued or it could be licensed or it could be sold or it could transition to phase two or it could transition to phase three. So basically the pathway that a drug needs to follow to be developed is very well understood. And eventually if it was successful, it could end up being approved by the regulatory authority, the FDA in the States. Alternatively, we could have a portfolio of drugs, as I said before, and as these drugs would be developed, some of them would transition to later stages of development, some of them could be sold, some of them could be discontinued. But the bottom line is, as they 
grow, as they are developed, as the process evolves, there is a, a value that is accrued. There is a value that is generated. And what we believe is that just like small biotech companies or medium-sized companies license and sell some of their assets, the same thing can be done at the level of a portfolio. And by virtue of doing that, as I said before, when we issue the securities, the equity and the debt, we would raise some funds that we would invest in those securities that need to be developed. And as they are developed, they generate the cash flows that would allow to pay the interest and would allow to pay the principal of the bonds that would ultimately be uh, redeemed. Now, this is the theory of how this would work. Let me show you the results. In order to do that, we need to create a model that has several inputs. For example, we need to analyze what are the transition probabilities. We need to analyze what are the correlation factors. How does the fact that one drug approved is approved influence the value and the probability that other drug gets approved? We also need to think through what are the costs of developing these drugs? What are the valuation of these drugs? Well, we did all of that homework using existing literature and using databases that we put together from different sources. Let me show you the results for two uh, particular uh, examples. This first example is an example where we would invest in 200 compounds. 100 of them would be in preclinical phase and 100 of them would be in phase one. And these compounds would be sold in phase two. This is similar to what a venture capital does. They license or they acquire the compounds when they're in preclinical or, or phase one and then when they get to phase two or phase two B, they go out and they sell it to a pharmaceutical company. So we designed a simulator that is a stochastical simulator that uses some transition probabilities matrix. And what we were able to do was to replicate what over different periods of time would happen with these drugs. For example, in the second period of time of those 200 compounds, 114 of them would on average be in phase one, 20.7 of them would be discontinued. Bear in mind that these are this, these numbers have decimal points because obviously we run this hundreds of thousands of times to come up with some form of you know, statistically meaningful results. And at the end of simulation, there would be, in theory, a number of compounds who would have been sold or would have got into the phase two of uh, their development. What would this mean for investors? Well, as we said before, you know, we would need to raise a capital structure with a senior debt that in this case we would issue $1.2 billion and they would get, according to our results, a 5% annual return with a probability of default of only 0.01 and expected loss smaller than 0.01%. The junior debt holders would get a return of 8% with very low probabilities of default. And the equity holders, the ones that would be paid at last, they would get an expected return of 8.9%. Similarly, we could do other simulations where, for example, we try to replicate what pharmaceutical companies do. And this means they invest in phase two compounds and they take them all the way to market. If we were to do that, the results for the debt holders and for the equity holders are here. What I think is important that you see out of this is that, as I said before, we build, we design a framework to simulate what would happen if we invested in these portfolios. And then we applied this simulator to alternative uh, cases in which we try to replicate what is going on in the industry. And what I think is important is that even if this is in theory, this proves the economic viability of constructing these portfolios in time. Obviously, you're probably going to tell me that there is a difference between theory and practice, and we all know that. But the bottom line is that I don't think investors had access to this type of analytics and therefore now they can express and make better judgments when it comes to deciding whether or not they will put their money in science. Let me just finish by saying that this is a work that we've started doing, but it requires from the collaboration of many people to be able to be implemented because obviously we're not experts in biotechnology. Although we think that there is enough financial technology to explore new ways to get in finance and to be able to build a bridge between the world of capital markets, between the folks at Wall Street and the works of, uh, of science, this is a, a very challenging uh, task. We believe that in order for us as a whole to be able to succeed in this challenge, there are different things that are important. One of them, we need supportive infrastructure. This means support from the government. This means the adequate regulation. This means the right accounting systems. We also need the right incentives. We know from the recent crisis and other crises that if the incentives are not well defined, there is a potential for abuse, there's a potential for fraud, and there's a potential for a new crisis. And more importantly, and this is how I will end, it is important that all of the different players in this industry embrace these ideas and the willingness to innovate to be able to succeed in our goals.
Thank you very much.